Welcome viewers and listeners to another edition of CHP Talks. I'm here today with Mr. Bill Whatcott, uh, who many of you will know by name. Uh, Bill, thanks for joining us today. And I'm going to give uh, folks a little introduction to you, but I uh, really appreciate you coming on today. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, for introducing Bill. I don't have a long uh, list of schools he's attended and things like that, but here's his description of himself. He says he's an imperfect Christian saved only by God's mercy and the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's got a quote here, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And that's found in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Uh, Bill has been to the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, defending himself and representing uh the rights of free speech and and those kinds of things. He's been dragged in front of Human Rights Commission three times. Uh, he had a case with Ronan Oje in British Columbia, and in that case, Bill was fined fifty five thousand dollars for so called misgendering and for encouraging people not to vote for Ronan during an election. Uh, he also he was had the vice thing- president of the BC NDP. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, well, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that after I finish introducing you. Jonathan Yaniv, uh, some of you may know him as the guy who wanted uh, female aestheticians to uh, massage his personal parts and, and uh, wax them and so on. Uh, Jonathan Yaniv uh, wanted to get $30,000 out of Bill. Uh, yeah, he started an investigation, but he abandoned it. Um, and then Bill was fined seventeen thousand five hundred dollars for criticizing homosexuality in the public schools. That was way back in two thousand one, the SHRC versus Bill Whatcott. And Bill has been sent to jail thirty times for picketing with graphic signs. So these are some of the ways that Bill has become known to the courts of Canada and and uh, the newspapers and so on. And but there's a lot more to Bill than uh, than what has been in the newspapers. And I know Bill as a committed Christian who loves people, doesn't hate them and wants the best for their lives. And that's why he speaks the truth. So, Bill, uh, thank you again for coming on the show. And and we want to start by talking about your most recent court case, one that uh, is kind of still ongoing and. Uh, can you tell us about that? It's King versus Whatcott. It's King Charles versus Whatcott. Yeah, it started as Queen Elizabeth versus Whatcott. It's been going for a while. Um, that's how the courts in Canada do it when it's the attorney general prosecuting you. And this originally started as a class action lawsuit. Um, it started as a $104 million lawsuit, in fact, uh, with Justin Trudeau and former Premier uh, Kathleen Wynne of Ontario, who is an out lesbian, uh, being part of the aggrieved parties. So I think I'm the only Canadian in all of history to be sued as a private citizen by a sitting Premier and and Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And really, it was for a pretty silly reason. Um, Just to give your your, uh, followers a bit of a background, I applied to march in the Toronto Homosexual Pride Parade. And keep in mind, we all pay for that. If you're in the city of Toronto, you pay for it with municipal taxes. If you're in the province of Ontario, you pay with provincial taxes. And I guess if you're in the city of Toronto, you pay with both provincial and municipal, so you get a double whack. And even if you're way off in the Northwest Territories, you're paying for the Toronto Pride Parade with federal taxes. All three levels of government feel a need to fund this thing. Um, it, it's a very offensive parade. There's nudity, there's sadomasochism, and every parade that I've filmed, and I've filmed a few over the years, have had very overt anti-Christian messages. Uh, F-U-C-K, the Christian right. Uh, the last parade I was in, they put Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, on their crotch as they marched. So in some ways, it's a very, very religious parade. Uh, there's not an absence of, of religion. But as Christians, we have to pay for this actual hate. And they do actually hate Christians, some of them. 
Um, so, you know, I thought, well, I got to pay for it. And St. Paul says, be all things to all people that you can <laughs> save some. So why not go there? That's, that's the unchurched. And actually, I have had a measure of success. I've been blessed to bring a couple homosexuals to the Lord. And more than one, I actually evangelized at a pride parade. So that, that works for those who say you're wasting your time. How much is one soul worth? And I've gotten about four or five. So praise God for that. So, so I, I asked to march as an openly Christian man, and I offered to pay the $100 that you have to pay to march. And um, they were a very intolerant parade. They said, you're not welcome in this parade or any subsequent parade. So to use their logic, because of Christian churches or pro-life organizations, weed one of these guys out, they go into the closet, they lie about who they are, and they infiltrate our organizations anyways. So I went in the closet. And then I reapplied as a gay zombie cannabis consumer. Mm -hmm. And uh, surprise, surprise, they accepted me. And then I somehow convinced seven other Christians to go in with me. And uh, we marched as a gay zombie cannabis consumers association. And I handed out more gospel in my life in a shorter period of time there than anywhere else. We got 3,500 gospel flyers disguised as zombie safe sex packages into the hands of prayed participants and onlookers. Yeah. Uh, so it was really a wonderful evangelism. And homosexuals, even though they don't mind wrecking the March for Life in Ottawa or trashing uh, pro-life uh, events in Toronto, I remember the HLI, Human Life International, they, they had no problem trashing that, uh, invading it, in fact. <clears throat> Um, they had no sense of humor at my stunt. I invaded nothing. I blocked nothing. I insulted no one. I did criticize the prime minister in my flyer, actually. And that's why he was part of the um, part of the class action. But it was all true. Um, so, yeah, they, they actually launched on Parliament Hill a $104 million lawsuit. They wanted to sue everyone who volunteered, anyone who gave me 20 bucks. They basically wanted to take their house and RSPs and they wanted to destroy me, and they were convinced there was a big money mega church behind me. They didn't understand that I got my zombie uh, costumes out of Value Village, and <laughs> and you know uh, basically ran the whole thing on like four grand, two thousand. I should note I I raised myself working as security uh, for the Teamsters on a gay movie set. They they put me on the movie set. I didn't really ask and. You know, everybody deserves to not have their cars stolen. So I was content to stay in the uh, parking lot as long as I didn't have to go on the set and be a part of the debauchery. And they paid me 25 bucks an hour for six weeks. And I used that to 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 infiltrate the homosexual parade and get all my activists there. So they'd really have to sue the gay movie in Toronto because they were my biggest sponsor, yeah. although they didn't know it. Yeah. Um yeah, the, 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 they, they discovered I had no money, and I would not give up the name of my friends. I said I'd sit in jail forever. And um, after, after about three years of trying, uh, Doug Elliott, the homosexual lawyer who, who launched this lawsuit with the help of George Smitherman, the deputy premier back in the day, and Hudspis, another homosexual activist, when they realized they weren't getting names out of me and they weren't finding any money, they discovered me upside down and sideways. And for most of it, I was in a one bedroom apartment, uh, bicycling to, you know, work that was about $2,000 a month. So there really wasn't nothing to, to take. Um, they gave up, but they really didn't give up. Then they got the attorney general of Ontario to put out a Canada wide arrest warrant for me. At that point, I was in Alberta. And they actually extradited me from Alberta two years after the fact and pursued with this insane criminal case. Now, I did have a good lawyer. He was not a friend of ours. Uh, he was Jewish and secular, I believe. But he did follow the law. And with reluctance, I would say, he acquitted me. He looked at the flyer and said, there's no actual hate in it. And there isn't hate. There is gospel and there is accurate medical facts. Um what can I say? Rather than let that go, they actually appealed it on Christmas Eve 2020. And then just last week, I was in the Ontario Court of Appeal in front of three Trudeau liberal appointed judges 
who are going to decide whether I need to go on trial again or whether or whether the acquittal stands. And that's and that's where it's at now. So so when you distributed the gospel literature, mm-hmm. uh, many, many of our listeners will know this, but you had them uh, kind of packaged up like like a condom. It was in a little package and it said, what, safe sex on Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I made it like a condom because these guys didn't want gospel, but they wanted condoms. Now, there was no condom in it. There was no rubber. Let's be clear. I believe that'd be a sin. But I packaged it so nobody would throw it out. Because remember, Planned Parenthood is there handing out real condoms. Um, There was other public health groups, so-called, that were handing out free condoms. Well, I made mine the best condom in the world. My package was four times the size of their packages. And I put zombie safe sex $5. Now, we didn't charge $5. We gave them for free. But everybody thought they had an awesome $5 condom. And some of the sodomites actually opened them up at 2 in the morning with their boyfriends. And then they got the testimony of Walt Hare, how he lived a life a life of uh, deception for eight years, calling himself a woman, and then found Jesus Christ and reclaimed his manhood. And then I had a um, testimony, I believe it was Dennis Jernigan, I think, who lived as a homosexual and picked up many men and became very depressed. And after trying suicide, he found Jesus Christ, and he's now married to the same woman for 30 years and has a music ministry. So they had very good information. They just didn't have rubber. Yeah, and then I then I also had the medical risks of homosexuality, and that really pissed them off. I was getting hate messages at two in the morning by the hundreds. Yeah, and did you also have the gospel? Was uh... the gospel was very very clear. People can see the flyer. Remember, even in the testimony of Walt Hare, he accepted Jesus Christ. But then I did have scripture. I had relevant scripture at the bottom of my flyer. And they got the scripture rather than hanky panky that doesn't really keep them safe. Um, and ninety nine percent didn't appreciate it, but one percent did. Yeah, so well, that was worth it. Yeah, it was uh, creative, and and I had not heard the part before that you uh, you actually tr- applied as a Christian first. <clears throat> I applied as an openly Christian man, and they wouldn't accept me, and they put me in the closet. Yeah, so well, they put a Canadian taxpayer in the closet wanted to be a part of their parade yeah. and they're all about diversity yeah so so this was a, a bit deceptive so <clears throat> tell us about the trial uh i mean so what what year was the parade that you you participated the in? parade was june 2016 and the media was absolutely gaga because the first prime minister in canadian history was marching in it no less uh the the chronic pride parade attendee justin trudeau yeah yeah okay yeah and and when did it first go to court they they went after you for uh, it, yeah yeah and they announced that on parliament hill i think in august 2016 so that was pretty fast it was like six weeks after i did this is the announcement on the parliament hill press gallery that 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 they're coming for me for 104 million and everybody associated with me they were, I didn't realize they were so mad, to be honest. <laughs> like, you know, people have pulled stunts on me, the homosexuals, and I, I don't get like that. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some pictures of you at that parade. It looked like you and your fellow uh, so-called gay zombies were uh, actually being quite friendly with the crowd. There was no... Oh, no... there was police looking for me when uh, some of the people opened it up and I was photo opping and hugging them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, no, no, we, we we weren't being mean to anyone. Yeah. No. No. And I, I think it's hilarious they were going after you for a hundred and four million dollars. Uh, I know that lots yeah. of people, you don't have a hundred and four dollars. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. No. And then you, when you think a hundred and four million, you should have at least dropped, you know, nuclear waste on a small town or something, you know, and utterly yeah. destroyed thousands of livelihoods to merit that kind of money. Yeah. Yeah. So. So then when did they extradite you from Alberta? Like that was some time. That later. was two years after the fact, almost two years to the day. In fact, I think that was June 2018 when they put out the Canada wide arrest warrant. 
And I was actually working up in Fort McMurray as a bus driver. And I was actually 100 miles north of Fort McMurray. So I was basically in the boreal forest. And then I was getting phone calls that the police were at former addresses where I lived. The landlord was calling me. They found some of my family members and showed up at their house. And then they had even ex-friends. I don't even know how they got them in two different provinces, uh, BC, Saskatchewan, some of my friends in Alberta. My uh, my wife was at home and the RCMP showed up at my actual house uh, looking for me. And then they were all phoning me. And I'm thinking, well, that many cops in that big of a geographical area, all of Western Canada, the three Western provinces, anywhere where I ever been, I thought this has to be really serious because I know when I was a regular criminal and stole a car, they never put those kind of resources into you ever. So, you know, I thought this is like, like murder and no. I better, I better deal with it. Cause I had no idea. And yeah. you know, my zombie flyers two years after the fact, I didn't yeah. think it could be that. So I actually phoned a Christian lawyer friend of mine and then he called uh, the Leduc RCMP because that was one of the RCMP actively sending people. Cause I lived for a time in Leduc. Um, and then they said, yeah, they got a Canada wide warrant from Toronto. And it appears to be for hate literature. And when I heard that, then I knew it was the gay zombie stunt. And I was actually pretty, pretty relieved because, oh. you know, yeah. So, so then you turned yourself in. Uh, yeah, I drove to Calgary and turned myself in. They flew you to Toronto. And I think they, yeah. if I remember the story, uh, then they wanted you to pay for the flight. Is that correct? Nope, nope, nope. The taxpayer was paying for the flight, but they did leave me without food for 24 hours. And I had a pretty high blood pressure, 180 over 100 and an eye infection. And they actually denied me my medications. The Toronto, the, the Calgary police, a couple of them were very nice. And a couple of them were very, very abusive and really unprofessional. Hmm. Well, yeah. so... You made a brief reference. I think we need to go back to that uh, about when you were a regular criminal. <laughs> oh yeah. Let, let, let's go a little bit back further in your life, uh, and uh, so to make a distinction between what you were doing then and what you're doing now, and what happened in between. Yeah, I was an atheist. I was brought up in essentially a non-Christian home. Um, and you know, it wasn't ideal. My dad was out of the picture when I was six years old and my mother did the best she could, but she was a, a, a serious alcoholic. Um, and then I guess at the age of 14, I wound up in foster care. And by then I was a very disturbed kid. So at one point uh, in Strathroy, Ontario, I tried to shoot up the uh, police station with a high powered slingshot and actually shot at the secretary at the desk as a very dangerous kid and they charged me initially with attempted murder and then dropped that and convicted me of malicious damage and uh, i think attempted assault or something anyways um anyways i wound up in the juvenile justice system and it was very kid gloves my life improved my standard of living approved and i liked being institutionalized i became institutionalized very quickly um, eventually you have to get let out to juvenile. I committed a nonstop crime spree while in custody. So I pretty much stayed in custody nonstop to the age of 16, was released uh, briefly and then tried to steal a car and uh, strike this person who tried to intervene with a chain. And at that time I was only 16, but I was charged as an adult because there was a period where the adult system kicked in at age 16. And I did wind up in jail, and that was pretty shocking. Uh, got beat up, and then was in segregation for three weeks. But by then, I was so institutionalized, so immoral, so used to stealing and lying and doing my own thing, that I really had no actual skill to go straight. So from the age of 17 to 18, I probably got arrested another few times, wound up in the young offender system, because that change happened where young offenders became 18 years old. And then uh, on to really serious crimes where they treated me more leniently than this flyer. Uh, the biggest crime that I committed was when I was 19, I tried to hijack a bus and we took hostages. 
that was in London, Ontario, and tried to run into a police station. And honest to goodness, the police response for that was less than my flyer. Uh, thankfully, there was an Anglican chaplain who was an evangelical, conservative, Bible-believing Anglican. They're a thing. Uh, they're, they are a minority in my experience. He came and visited me every week while I was in segregation. Um, I did wind up in segregation again, uh, rode a death threat to a guard, set a fire to a workplace that I was working in, and they just left me there for six months solid. And uh, they even took out my mattress. I had to sleep on concrete. But this guy came, and I think he gave me a Bible, or he got a guard to give me a Bible. And I started reading that, and I kept that under my head. And um, yeah, yeah, that, that, eventually, that eventually held. And I did make a profession of faith in a graveyard in July 1986, hence a, a book that I wrote long, long time ago, Born in a Graveyard. And those processes dramatically changed my life. And then I became a nurse and graduated with honors um, a couple of years after I got out of jail, which is a miracle in and of itself. And then in 1994 is when I prayed in front of an abortion clinic and discovered when the system uh, really doesn't like you. Yeah. Oh, I can't hear you. There's no uh, voice. You're, sorry, uh, you're at... You're a testament to the redeeming power of Jesus Christ, who took you out of darkness, brought you into the marvelous light, and and then he's put you on a very interesting path, confronting the social ills uh, of society of abortion and uh, gender indoctrination and all those kinds of things, restrictions on freedom of speech. And I have to thank you, Bill, for standing up for all of us in terms of... Um, protection of our right to speak truth, even when it is, um, you know, not politically correct, even when it's not appreciated by the public, by the media, or by the government. Yeah, and I have to say it's interesting, because back in those teenage years, it was all about me. And because social workers tell you you're a good person, even when you're not, I believe to the core of my being, as I stole and wrecked people's lives, that I was basically good. And I did nothing for anybody, nothing. Even my own friends I stole from. And then when I found Christ, I realized I was no good. And that was a good thing. It was really good. And then I started worrying about others. And that's when I started looking at the bigger issues other than myself. Right. And praise God that he could do that. But then that's when Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 kicks in. You, re you realize you didn't merit this. This is God's grace and mercy on me, a sinner. You know, and that that's a very good thing to understand, that we are sinners saved by God's grace alone. Thank you for that, uh, bringing us up to date on where you came from and how you entered into what you're doing now. Um, let's just backtrack a little bit, and, and we won't spend a lot more time on on uh, this question, but you recently had your case was appealed and you had a three judge panel looking yeah. at whether or not this distribution of literature constitutes hate and uh, describe that court process a little bit and, and maybe the background of the judges that that uh, heard your case. Yeah, let me just pull that up because I think their names and curriculum vitae's are important. Um, okay, the first judge on this three-judge panel that I looked into was uh, Justice Justice um, Copeland, um, Justice Jill Copeland. Uh, she is appointed to the bench, I think in 2018, by the Trudeau federal government. That might have been the disgraced minister, David Lametti, that actually uh, had the ceremony and the appointment, but it certainly didn't happen without Trudeau's knowledge. Um, her claims to fame is uh, doing pro bono work for Little Sisters Bookstore in Vancouver, which is a lesbian bookstore collective, if you want to call it that. 
And back in the 90s, uh, Canada Border Service uh, Agency made some sort of half-hearted attempt to keep hard homosexual pornography out of our country. And uh, she felt that was free speech and therefore took that case. And as we know, she prevailed. Um, another interesting case that should have been appealed and never was, uh, Justice uh, uh, Copeland uh, had a black fella by the name of uh, Shaquin. Now, now this guy, Shaquin Stewart, uh, he was into dealing drugs, and he was caught in a police sting with a loaded Glock 9 millimeter. He did not have a firearms license, and in fact, the gun had a prohibited high-capacity magazine. Uh, when the police chased him, he ran through a public school yard and threw the gun, and police didn't find it. Thankfully, a little kid didn't find it because that would have been a tragedy. There was actually a bullet in the chamber, and all the kid had to do was pull the, the trigger, and it would have been perhaps someone's life being lost. Uh, a janitor found the gun, and Shaquin was, was duly charged with a uh, prohibited firearm, careless uh, handling of a firearm, throwing it into a, into a, um, into a schoolyard, and presumably his, his, his drug charges. Um, uh, Copeland, for all her wisdom, found that the real problem wasn't his loaded handgun or drug dealing. It was the fact that he's a, a victim of systemic racism. And, you know, I lived in Toronto. I had black supervisors who were nurses, and they seemed, if anything, to have fewer barriers than me on the upward mobility. So I don't really buy this systemic racism. It seems any black who wants to go to school has a few more bursaries at their disposal than I do. And if they work hard, they really do fine in this life. Uh, in fact, they even become judges and politicians and certainly nurses and doctors. I had a family doctor who was black for a couple of years. Um, so it's rubbish. But anyway, she found that that was, that was the important thing. And she actually gave this guy two years probation. Um, to me, if I was a Crown prosecutor, I would have said there's an error in law, but they, they let it stand. And then six weeks later, he was caught in a stolen car with another loaded handgun. And so, uh, you know, with, with such competence, Trudeau was impressed. And she got appointed shortly after that case to the Ontario Court of Appeal and sat as one of my judges. The other one was Justice Allison Harvison Young. Uh, she's also a Trudeau appointee. Uh, most of her interest is not that controversial. It was mostly property law and small claims court, and she wrote extensively on that. As a superior court judge, she had a visible minority gun criminal uh, who shot someone in a Vietnamese restaurant. Uh, the person lived but had permanent injuries. Uh, to her credit, she didn't go on about systemic racism. She just gave the guy... 11 years for being the, the thug he is, which 11 years might be lenient in some countries, but in Canada, that's pretty good. Uh, she also ruled in favor of a father who is being chronically denied access of his, to his children. So I, I don't have a lot bad to say for her, except being a Trudeau appointee, you know that she has to be pro-homosexual and pro-abortion. Uh, Trudeau doesn't make it a secret that, that those are needed qualities to be a judge. Uh, the other one is uh, Justice Lorne Sawson, he, him. Uh, this guy was an academic. <clears throat> uh, he has a Twitter account where he assumes you don't know that he's a male. So he helps you out and gives you his pronouns, he, him. He's done a lot of writing on so-called diversity, diversity from the liberal point of view. That's not diversity for Christians to be able to participate in the public square. Uh, his concern is that there's not enough black and indigenous transvestite and homosexual judges. Um, and he's actually written that there should be mandatory reporting on diversity quotas uh, with a view of possibly imposing quotas on private law practices as well as the courts. <clears throat> he also wrote a paper on uh, combating hatred and participated, hatred being flyers like mine, or maybe a Holocaust denial. He does have a concern for that. I think he is uh, Jewish. He's written for B'nai B'rith. And he also um, participated in a conference 
was Reverend Brent Hawks and Douglas Elliott, the lawyer who sued me for 104 million. Brent Hawks is a so-called pastor of a homosexual church in Toronto. Um, and, and he and he participated in a symposium with them combating hatred in the 21st century. Uh, of course, he's also a Trudeau appointee. Uh, so those are my three judges. And so, you know, with God, all things are possible. But if I have a hundred bucks, I don't think I'm going to get a fair hearing out of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, that's that's a general problem with our court system today. Um, we lost uh, maybe one of the better Supreme Court justices recently uh, who has resigned as a result of allegations being made against him. And so Trudeau will get to appoint one more uh, Supreme Court judge. Uh, and I think that would be that would be the sixth. So six out of nine appointed by Trudeau. And we know where he stands on all things that are. Yeah. And some of the Harper appointees were pretty dreadful already. So it's yeah. not good. So it's, uh, it's a, a sad day when we think of uh, the Supreme Court being stacked against the things that we believe in and, and truth, righteousness. And yeah, not even an understanding that we have a right to advance our beliefs in the public square. Yeah. It's not even that they have to agree with us. Just no. understanding a democracy is someone has a heartfelt political or moral point of view. Let them speak their mind if they're not committing acts of violence. No. So, Bill, when do you expect to hear the result of your court case? Uh, Mr. Rosen, my lawyer, who was also the lawyer who represented Paul Bernardo, uh, a very competent lawyer, um, he expects the ruling somewhere around four to seven months. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we certainly hope you get uh, justice. Uh, and we know that as Christians, if we don't get justice in this life, we will get it in the in the life to come. So, uh, but we we look for kingdom principles to be manifested down here and we work to bring those to pass so thank you for being a person who stands up for truth and for life and for uh, a biblical view of sexuality which is of course increasingly uh, uh, despised by the ruling elite in this country and that sometimes includes the courts so bill whatcott thank you for joining us today we wish you all the best uh, in the days ahead and, we, and that this court case will unfold uh, as it should. Thank you. And God bless you. And you have a nice day, too. Thanks a lot, John. Bye-bye. You have a good day. Bye-bye.